It's interesting because the uh, the narrative has obviously shifted from total cholesterol to LDL, and as you mentioned, you know there's still a good weight of evidence showing that the higher levels are going to be predictive of cardiovascular events. But we do get these individuals who will have higher total cholesterol, have higher LDL, and all other markers are seemingly in, in good standing order. And I think that's where it gets a little bit, uh, um, you know, confusing, if you will, from a pra- practical standpoint. Because if you know, do we then? Do, as you mentioned, you know, just hammer down LDL with a medication despite any other risk factors or is or is there potentially more going on? And this maybe, you know, leads into the conversation around other markers. Um, and before we even talk about markers around inflammation, you know, what about things like, you know, even ApoB, ApoA, you know, some of these markers that I often see not even run before we're, we're giving out medications as well. Should those always be run as well as part of a, uh, a panel if, if someone is indeed going to be potentially medicated? Uh, I, I don't know that always so, some people are so obviously risk, True. high risk. It, it's, it, it's okay to go ahead. Uh, I think it's not run enough. And um, so for instance, someone who is within guidelines, but they have a family history, instead of making the assumption that, well, hey, we got these numbers looking good, and even though both your parents had heart disease by the time they were 60, you know, you're good according to this population study of 30,000 people, so you're good. And I think those that's a great area for intervention and looking at those, those APOA proteins and lipoprotein A, looking at those heart attack proteins to say, well, it's, it's a distribution curve of people that are very much, you know, right in the middle of having having those apo proteins as sort of a baseline, kind of a, a a normal, if you will. And there's people on either tail of that curve. Some people are just blessed with great apo proteins that vacuum up wayward cholesterol and take it to the liver, no, no matter what they eat. Mm-hmm. And there's others that, you know, are actually doing a lot of the right things, but uh, and and even even if their actual lipid levels or VLDL or other things aren't high, which is kind of a, a certain familial condition people can have, they're 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 getting um, they're getting more cholesterol deposition in their arteries. It reminds me of a great cartoon in the New Yorker where a doctor's talking to a patient and he's got a lab result and he says, "Well, it looks like forty percent of your cholesterol is good, forty is bad, and twenty is undecided." <laughs> So <laughs> there's a lot of mitigating factor that changes, um, you know, the way I'd put it to a, a person who's not as into this stuff as I am would say, well, there's things that can make that cholesterol more sticky and more of a menace. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I guess, you know, since atherosclerosis is at the heart of all this and it's an inflammatory condition and disease, it would obviously seem like a good place to start to gather more information around having more biomarkers and data around arterial inflammation and potentially stability of plaques and things like that. And of course, this is where some of these more novel biomarkers that you you know write about and speak about quite quite frequently of inflammation that become more important. And you know, maybe we can start the conversation here around you know C-reactive protein, which is one that's commonly run in, in a, you know in a medical checkup. You know, acute phase protein released by the liver during inflammation. It's playing a unique role in the immune response. Can you talk a bit about CRP and its and its role here and in, in, as a marker of inflammation? Yeah, CRP C reactive protein. It's very highly you know associated or correlated with cardiovascular disease. So although you know although it can be high because of other things like maybe you have a dental abscess and it's causing this reactivity it is it it is really associated there so for instance the higher crp level patients have been shown to have twice the mortality if they have a heart attack they're twice as likely to die and just in terms of disease progression crp is a really good a uh, really good predictor of of someone's possible of someone's possible uh, progression. So, in other words, will somebody uh, find themselves at a heart disease uh, state more quickly 
um, the uh, the uh, placking that might happen um, is more likely, and it is getting some it is getting some attention from internists um, and some cardiologists who order it along with the lipid panel. And I think some of that attention comes from the fact that in some of the larger trials, um, the statins, in particular Vesuvastatin, which people know as Crestor, lowered CRP. And the more it lowered it, the patients that really got the lowering effect had fewer heart attacks um, as a group. So, But what's interesting at the same time is many, many cardiologists and internists don't order it at all. They, they, um, they like to have one target to hammer away at, mm. and and CRP is not it. 